Hello, and welcome to DU's 20th Annual Diversity Summit. We are glad you could join us for this session. In the spirit of healing and peace, we acknowledge and honor the indigenous peoples of the land upon which the University of Denver stands, the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute tribes. A few reminders before we get started. This year, we as a DU community will be exploring the interplay and intersections of the impact of 2020 through a lens of anti-racism and anti-discrimination. Together, we will examine the many ways in which our collective past informs our shared diversity, equity, and inclusion work for the future. For some, the topics covered may include triggering or emotionally challenging topics. Please feel free to exit the event and return later as necessary. We will be closely monitoring our time together and do not condone threatening or violent language. Rather, this space is meant to provide us opportunities to learn, question, and grow. We hope you will join us in this journey. Please note your camera is off and your microphone is muted. The Q&A feature is at the bottom of your screen for you to ask questions of the panelists. We will attempt to answer as many questions as possible. The conversation is being recorded and will be made available on Canvas and YouTube within a week of this event. Here's a quick reminder of the Zoom controls. Take a moment to locate the chat, Q&A feature, closed caption, and leave buttons at the bottom of the screen. And lastly, we ask that you share your experience via social media. We will be using the hashtag DU Diversity Summit throughout these seven weeks. And now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator or one of our panelists rather for the sessions, the DEI committee member at Daniels College of Business, Alicia Lucero. Hi everyone, I'm Alicia Lucero or Alicia Lucero, Assistant Director of Graduate Admissions at the Daniels College of Business. And also as mentioned, a Daniels DEI committee member, Federica Bologna, who supports the MBA at Denver Business Development. And I meet weekly with a group of our amazing business graduate students. And we organize these awesome events and overall create space to galvanize DEI initiatives here at Daniels, DU and our external community. Faculty member Lowell Valencia Miller also works with us. And so I just want to thank everyone um, who put together this event and DU's DEI Summit as well and the Dean's Office of Daniels for supporting today's event. Today we're going to discuss the roots and implications of the white supremacist and nationalist movements as captured by the Atlantic's film documentary, White Noise. I want to extend a warm welcome to Daniel Lombroso, the director of the film, and to our DU faculty, Tricia Olson and Michael Myers. Stephanie O'Malley is unfortunately unable to join us today after all. Before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone that you may use the Q&A feature to ask questions of our panelists at any time. We'll also be curating some of those questions for the moderator to ask in one of two live Q&A sessions during today's events. And with that, allow me to introduce to you Hasib Nazri Nazrila, Naris Rula, I'm sorry always working on names, who will be moderating today's event. Hasib is a second year MBA student at the Daniels College of Business here as well, and is also completing a graduate certificate in global business and corporate social responsibility jointly with the Corbell School of International Studies. Among his many roles on campus, he serves as VP of Inclusion for the Graduate Business Students Association and sits on Daniels DI Graduate Subcommittee. I'll now turn it over to him for the remainder of today's events. Thank you, Alicia, and thank you to everyone joining us today. I first saw White Noise back in December, and at the time I was merely fascinated by what I perceived to be fringe or radical movement that I knew little about. But I think in the aftermath of the January 6th Capitol riots, um, the challenge of rising white supremacy and nationalist movements has become more salient. That's why it's so important we have conversations like the one we're having today. So to help us have this conversation, I'd like to introduce some of our panelists. Um, so first of all, I'd like to introduce the film's director, Daniel Lombroso. Um, he's a director and journalist. Uh, for five years, he was a staff producer at The Atlantic, where he had directed award-winning projects exploring Russian espionage, the Israeli settlement movement, far-right Christian media, and more. He was reported across the US, Europe, Russia, and the Middle East, 
graduated from McGill with a degree in political science and now lives in New York City. And this film is his feature, uh, feature film debut. Thanks for joining us, Daniel. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Next, I'd like to introduce um, Professor Trisha Olson. Um, she's an associate professor in the Department of Business Ethics and Legal Studies and associate dean for Daniels College's undergraduate programs. Since her arrival here in 2011, she's been researching political economy of development in emerging countries with a focus in Latin America, as well as teaching cour courses that address business and politics through non-market strategy and corporate social responsibility. She's consulted for the United Nations Working Group on Business and Human Rights, the Global Business Initiative, and other global agencies. She's currently working on a research project about corporate human rights abuse with funding from the National Science Foundation. Thanks for joining us, Trisha. Thanks for having me. And then finally, I'd like to introduce Professor Mike, Michael Myers. Um, he's an associate professor at Daniels in the marketing department, and he's been teaching classes around digital marketing, branding, and social media here since 2010 and has a wide range of consulting experience in the industry. Thank you, Michael, for joining us. Thank you. Awesome. So just a little bit of logistics. Our event today, as Alicia alluded to, will be divided into two parts um, with a bathroom break in between for uh, me and the panelists. Um, for our first part, we'll focus on the roots of rising white nationalism and the alt-right as showcased in the film. Um, and then for the second part, we'll talk more about those implications for the business world since after all, we are a business school. Um, so I'd like to start first, Daniel, if you could give us an overview a little bit of your film's backstory. So how did you decide to make this film? How did you choose the people that were featured in it? And how did you convince them to participate in this? Hey, everyone. Um, so I'm, I'm Jewish. I'm the grandson of two Holocaust survivors, actually. And, you know, I started covering the alt-right uh, back in 2016 when President Trump announced his candidacy. And at the time, the group was not getting a lot of coverage. And you know, I was really stunned by the racism and anti-Semitism that was surging online, but also on college campuses, which I had just left a few years earlier. So it started with just a pretty basic question, you know, what is this group? What do they believe? And why are they coalescing, coalescing behind then candidate Trump? So it started with a few um, short documentaries and articles. In one of them, I caught a room full of people breaking out into Nazi salutes, which you saw in the film, but we also put out as a self-contained uh, clip. It was in November 2016, a week after President Trump won the election, where Richard Spencer said, hail Trump, hail our people, hail victory. It was a very important moment, journalistically speaking, because it clarified that this wasn't a new edgy kind of conservatism like was discussed at the time, if you're able to go back four or five years ago. It was fundamentally a racist movement, an anti-Semitic movement, a white nationalist movement. So we put out that clip. I returned to my day job, which was uh, difficult and confusing, covering all sorts of issues. Charlottesville happened about eight months after that. When Charlottesville happened, we understood that this movement was only growing in strength and it required a more concerted effort. So the editor in chief of the Atlantic gave me permission to pursue a feature length uh, project. Nice, and, and how, did, um, how did you end up getting access to these different people that are featured in the film and convincing them to be a part of it? It was a very long and rigorous process. I mean, I think there's a misconception that the alt-right thinks all publicity is good publicity. That's true only if they're in control of the narrative. So they actually love showdown style interviews, like a 60 minutes interview, because Mike Cernovich will just cut it up for his, in for his YouTube channel and make it Mike Cernovich destroys mainstream media journalist or whatever. This sort of all access kind of unvarnished approach, what we call verite in documentary filmmaking was very difficult to achieve. Spencer took a few months. Mike Cernovich took a few months more than that. Lauren Southern, who I think is the most important character in the film. It's very rare to see a young woman as kind of the face of a racist movement, but she's highly influential and in a way is kind of the most savvy at radicalizing young kids and drawing them into this movement. It took eight months to convince her. And I think it was, you know, a, I'm a journalist, I mentioned I'm also Jewish, it's two things that, that this movement despises. So I had uh, a lot up against me and I think it was really just a matter of being persistent, showing up and, and, and really communicating to them that, that, was, that I was sincere, that even though I'm categorically opposed to everything they represent, 
I wanted to understand them. I wanted to understand their psychology. And then I would actually do the work and do it in a thoughtful way. And, you know, we can, we can talk more. I'm, they're not happy with the film, but I think they would admit and everyone would admit that it's ultimately fair to them. It's, it's a, an accurate representation of the movement. And I think that sincerity, sincerity must have come across because they allowed me to spend three years of my life <laughs> following them around the world in the end. Yeah. What kind of impact has creating, I mean, you said it, this, this is a three-year project that has roots that go even further beyond that. Yeah. What kind of impact has creating this film had for you personally? It's a difficult question. I, you know, I think it's been un unsettling how mainstream, how naked the racism is that still shapes our society. I mean, we talk a lot about subconscious bias and structural racism. And I imagine you guys have been talking about that a lot in the workshops you've been doing over the past week. I think what was most jarring to me was how naked the racism still is in our society, how Lauren Southern can walk through downtown Toronto and just talk openly about how she doesn't see a non-white person and be you know, openly mocking people of color and Muslims and, and feeling real privilege to, to be able to do that, feeling no shame at all. How, how mainstream, you know, 70 years after the Holocaust that many of the same ideas and notions and symbols are, are rising again in this movement, but also with the, the QAnon conspiracy, which has really risen over the past year. So, I mean, I, I found it to be incredibly demoralizing. <laughs> And, you know, there's a lot of work left to be done and there's a lot of positive trends, which we could talk about as well. But I think it was shocking to me initially just how mainstream this stuff is and how, how integrated it is into all of our lives, that it's not a Southern phenomenon or a Christian phenomenon. It's not the uneducated or the uncouth. It's, it's, it's really, you know, people of privilege, people of wealth, people who are educated, who live in New York City like me who believe these things and propagate them and, and ultimately are, are making them go mainstream and in a way that they haven't in many, many years. And were there any key messages or takeaways or themes that sort of came out through this process that you decided were gonna be important to communicate through the film? I think the one I mentioned is one is the mainstreaming. The other one, which was shocking to me once I was inside and I think is really at the heart of the film is how broken these people are inside. I think it's important to understand how radicalization works. And it really appeals to the disaffected, the disillusioned, people who are looking for a sense of purpose in the world. It's almost like joining a gang or it's similar to the ISIS narrative where you hear about the people who joined the Islamic State were mostly middle-class kids from London, from Paris. It's a very similar narrative that I encountered. The people who are joining the alt-right mostly are coming from at least some privilege but oftentimes have a kind of a confused identity. They're really not, they're, they're mad at the world. They're looking for a scapegoat. And in this, in this ideology, which is an intensely emotional ideology, it's not, people always say, well, you have to be ignorant to be racist or it's incoherent. It doesn't matter. It really, I, in, in one of the pieces I wrote for the Atlantic, I wrote that the hatred feels good. I mean, it's almost like a drug. And when you're around these people and when you're at their events, you can really feel the kind of dark energy and the way that it intoxicates these people that they, they kind of get drunk on it, they get sucked in. And then, you know, when you're part of a community, like any community, like any gang, it's very hard to get out. And I think that was a pretty disturbing finding that this is a community, radicalization is a real thing that happens online, but then eventually becomes real in the real world. And once you're in it, it's very, very difficult to escape it. And from all the people that you interacted with through the process of making this, did you come across anyone who was able to get out or did start trying to, you know, I like that you use the word radicalize because I think that that is really key to what's going on here. And so did you see that there were any strategies for de-radicalizing people who had gotten really deep into this movement? So I think in the film, you see two of the subjects, Cernovich and Lauren, kind of cynically move away from the movement when it doesn't help their brand anymore. And I was very cognizant of, you know, I wanted to show kind of the blatant opportunism that was at play there. I think a lot of people used the brand all right when it was favorable. I know that sounds shocking now, but at the time it was a cool thing. They used it to become rich or famous. And then when it wasn't favorable anymore, they pivoted away from it. And you see Cernovich in the film start selling lifestyle products and, and facial skincare products. 
So that in my mind is an insincere evolution to your point. That's not leaving the movement. It's just pivoting away from it. Many of the people I've met and many of the people now that Trump lost, you know, they want to work again. They want to be able to raise money. They want to be able to buy a house in the neighborhood and not be shamed. So they're doing kind of the Cernovich maneuver where it's a pivot without saying sorry. And I think the film makes clear that that's really the bulk of the movement of the probably close to a hundred people I've met. I can count on, on one hand, definitely on one hand, who, the, the number of people who've left and the way they've been able to do it is really by owning up and expressing regret. And they also, I'm thinking of one person in, in particular, I don't want to say his name, but he had an off ramp. He, he was able to find a position, a well-paying job that paid him and that gave him the opportunity to invest in, in more progressive work. So he actually had an outlet where he could express remorse, which is important, but then also, you know, become a, a you know, a, a contributing member of society again. So it's a very, very difficult conversation. And I think the key is to be clear eyed and to see through the people who are genuine versus the people like a who are using it for, for reasons to rebrand or to kind of pivot away from something that has become a, a, a dangerous brand. You also mentioned that um, Laura Southern was one of the, uh, more important persons for you in this film. And I definitely, that came across to me as I was watching the film, um, that her storyline was definitely compelling. Um, I wonder if you could tell us a little more about why you thought that um, she was an important character to include and became the primary one for you. Well, I think the first is that she's the most, she, at the beginning of the, when I began reporting the story, she was the most influential woman on the far right. And you could argue still is to some extent. It's also very, you know, women, historically have a very important role in white nationalist movements. White nationalists are obsessed with demographics. So they're obsessed with preserving white majorities in the US, but also in European contexts. Part of that begins with the male role, which is to be a fighter, to be a conqueror, to be dominant. The way Richard Spencer says to be white is to be a crusader. But women also have a very important role in the movement where they're, they're baby makers, they're domestic. You know, Gavin McInnes at one point in the film says, don't have two kids or three kids have, I think he says five kids. And that he's, you know, he's putting that on a woman. It's, it's really their role to be the avatars of femininity. What was fascinating to me about Lauren from the get-go is that even though she's this image of the white conservative blonde woman, she despises that lived experience. You know, you see her on a date with a conservative man, she's miserable. Um, you know, she believes women should be in the home and yet she's traveling the world making far right propaganda videos. She's like the epitome of a, fe of a feminist woman who's very, not in her views, but in her ambitions that she's traveling. She doesn't want to be in the home. And of course, she embodies so many contradictions. I am hope this isn't a spoiler for the people on this, but, you know, she, she ends up with a non-white partner, even though you spend the entire film watching her talk about, um, you know, preserving white demographics in the U.S. and Europe. So... There was just so, you know, as a documentary filmmaker, especially the kind that I am, where you're following a story, really like in a journalistic capacity, you don't know where it's going to lead you. It's not a retrospective documentary where you're asking questions and looking back. It's really you're taking a bet on someone. You're saying, okay, Cernovich is going to be interesting. Lauren from the get-go was just immediately compelling. Very, she doesn't do any press. This is the first time she's ever participated in something. And the contradictions and hypocrisies were obvious from the start and just became more blatant over the, the two or three years that we ended up working together. Yeah, I also, I found that, you know, there, the, the film is primarily about white supremacy and racism, but I think with her storyline, you brought a little bit of the sexism and misogyny into it. And, and I definitely felt that when she was getting interviewed by Gavin McGinnis, you, you saw that front and center, but also in the fact to your point, alluding to that, she ends up marrying a, a person who's non-white and having children with them. She goes to such lengths to hide the identity of her partner and her child. And you compare that to Mike Cernovich, who's married to, I think it's a Persian woman, right? Mm -hmm. And there's no attempt on his part to hide the identity of his partner or of his children because his followers aren't going to, you know, get angry at him for having married a non-white person. Whereas for Lauren, unfortunately, it's like she's a traitor to her movement. Exactly. Very well said. And, you know, I think it's important to see this movement not to pardon it in any way, but as a spectrum and, you know, Spencer being a white power ideologue, he's really a 20, like 
a neo-Nazi who's heavily inspired by 20th century fascism. Cernovich is kind of the squishier variety where he's willing to flirt with that stuff, but also pivots away from it when it's not convenient for him. Lauren is sort of in the middle where I think ideologically is much more like Richard, but tactically is much more skilled at appearing like Cernovich. She's good at, she's good at winking to white nationalism without actually saying it. And it's a very astute observation on your point that her fan base is much less tolerant of any divergence from the white nationalist creed. So when she, there are many threads online about her partner and her life choices, both in terms of the person she ended up with, but other things really heavily criticizing her for not fulfilling the white nationalist ideal. And Cernovich as sort of an alpha male bro who came from the pickup artist scene somehow, you know, exonerates himself from that. And it's really misogyny. I mean, Lauren, despite all of the very, you know, the terrible views that she propagated and helped bring mainstream, experienced some things as a woman that no one deserves to go through, that she didn't deserve to experience. And, uh, you know, it's just a sad reality of being a woman in that space where it's, it's deeply predatory. And all of the discussions we have about Me Too that exist in the workplace are, you know, of course, are mainstream in our everyday life, but they exist times a thousand on the far right and have, are normalized to an extent that you're not even able to talk about them. So, you know, Lauren was very, very stuck in that space. And there's a moment in the film where you think maybe she's going to leave, but ultimately decides to stay and stay in it. And it's, it's sad, but she's actually now as right wing as she's ever been. Yeah. Yeah. So now maybe we can turn to our other panelists to get some of their impressions of the movie. Um, Trisha, can we start with you? Thinking of your area of expertise, what were some of the key themes or messages you took away from this film? Yeah, of course. And you know, thank you again to everybody for putting this event on. Thank you, Daniel, for creating the film and making it available. Um, I just wanna reiterate that I think it's so important for us to have these spaces and places in which we can talk about these issues. So thanks to everybody who's been behind this event. Yeah, so as you know, I'm studying the political economy of development. So I'm always thinking about, well, where's the money in all of this, right? And it was just front and center in the film. And so I think, you know, the thing that really, there are many, many themes, um, you know, the mental health theme, fear, um, but I really do tend to focus on sort of the political economy and the public good. So in some ways, I was just thinking so much about how financial incentives um, behind these platforms, you know, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, there are serious financial incentives to create these figures. It drives traffic. And so there's a, an organizational incentive on behalf of the businesses, but then you can see clearly in the film that the individuals as well begin relying heavily, very heavily, I got the, the feeling, on the money that they're raising from their followers, um, you know, even from their own content production and probably ad, you know, driving ads uh, through through these various platforms. So I just think the financial piece is fascinating to me. And also, you know, Daniel, you did a phenomenal job of sort of covering when they were down on their luck and needing more money. And how do you, you know, so here they're in this strange situation where is this a job? Like is this is, has become a job. And so just the fame and kind of, it just perpetuates itself as well, um, which I thought came across in the film really in a really interesting way. The other key theme, um, which is really more around the public good, I think is just that we are in an era of disinformation and misinformation. And so thinking through what that means for the health of our democracy, the future of our democracy, our communities. And you know, as a faculty member, I think about just our students. Um, you know, and so I think there are a lot of really important conversations that should be had about the role of social media, the fact that companies can create these people who, you know, really wouldn't have a platform or as large of a platform um, were they not able to manipulate uh, the content in, in combination with the way in which we know social media companies work. So I can talk more about that later, but those are just sort of some of the initial impressions and, and themes that came across to me. Thank you. And Michael, what about you? What were some of the key themes that stood out to you considering your marketing background? Oh, you're muted. I was going to say exactly what Trisha said, but uh, she said it better. So it's awesome. No, I think it was an unbelievably timely film. And, and the way I think about it is there's this, there's this kind of chapter effect 
for me or this this kind of essay effect of this movie was first and then or, and then I saw the social network uh, the social dilemma second and that really was it was the you know and then you watch what happened in the Capitol and it was not at all surprising so if you had seen those documentaries in, in that order you were like well of course these people have been misfed information etc. And so there's not at all surprising. And of course, there's always going to be people that seek out to build personal brands and monetize their personal brands and use divisive techniques to get that to be, right? So you may have true believers on one side, but then people like Lauren, et cetera, are, are playing with it and kind of, <clears throat> you know, toying with it to help monetize their existence. And once you, and I mean, aside from just the monetization, there, there's a real dopamine hit and oxytocin hit from getting people to act on your um, content. And so as a consequence, it is literally like a drug, right? So um, not at all surprising, terrifying in many respects. And it's interesting to think about where the kind of belief around, I really believe this and or I'm utilizing this as a tool to get to point B. And so, you know, um, those are some initial thoughts from a psychological standpoint, just kind of the term lost souls just kind of kept floating through my mind and who planted that seed at what age and to, to, to manifest itself in this way. And it was, um, it was sad, you know, because um, when you look at kids, you see nothing but potential. And then you think about somebody giving them, you know, a, the wrong seed and, and it just blossoms in this way. And you go, wow, we really need to really need to help individuals if we can. Yeah, I definitely got that same. Uh, there's almost a tragic component when you're watching the film. Um, I wonder, Daniel, was that uh, intentional on your part? Did you want to also convey these these people as sort of <clears throat> tragic, or did that just naturally come out? That just naturally came out. I think it being what you what <clears throat> what you call a follow film. It's about ca it's about, it's about really holding a mirror to the individuals you're covering in your capacity as a journalist and when you spend hundreds, really thousands of hours with someone across, I think, 12 states and five countries, over time, the layers come down and you come to just expo see them for who they are, both me as an individual, but also for the audience um, who's watching the film. And, you know, I think the easiest example would be Cernovich. He projects alpha male. He lives on sunshine and sunshine. He drives up Pacific Coast Highway. He has the loving wife who really does love him unequivocally, even though she's Persian and they have, have Persian kids. But, you know, he does a great job for his audience of projecting a certain image and really helping people, getting people to gravitate into this movement because he's this larger than life figure who offers a certain value system and really a kind of a feeling of comfort, almost like a mob boss that if you're under Cernovich's protection and control, you'll feel better. A lot of your insecurities in life will get resolved. Many people in the movement actually trust him. So when someone I know, Lucian Wintrich, who's a secondary character in the film, when he went through a breakup, Mike Cernovich was his first phone call because he's sort of like a father figure in the movement. But I think to the point about Lost Souls is it became evident pretty quickly that the public persona is really at odds with the private persona. And Cernovich is someone who's you know, he, he took most of his money in alimony from his first wife, who was a high powered lawyer at a tech company in Silicon Valley. He's, he, you know, he struggled with, with depression. His family has a long history of mental health problems. You know, he has a very sad story with his mother who struggled with mental health herself. And he admits towards the end of the film, which was a, it was like a three hour car ride. And in that interview, eventually the, you know, the layers came down and he said, I'm not someone who actually, I'm not someone who likes myself very much. I project, you know, like I'm a, like I'm a WWE fighter, or that I'm a, you know, a, a cultural movement leader, I think is the word he uses, but that he actually hates himself. And I think to me, when that moment happened, it really clarified kind of the grift at the heart of the movement that a lot of these individuals publicly are, are hawking something that privately they don't believe or that they don't feel. Many of them are struggling with all sorts of, um, you know, feelings of unhappiness or insecurity or depression or anxiety. And and a lot of it is caused by what Michael and Trisha were saying, which is a social media environment that really depends on dopamine, that depends on positive reinforcement. And when your entire identity is constructed based on people liking or retweeting or agreeing with or disagreeing with what you're saying online, it's very difficult to have any sense of identity outside of that space. Yeah. How, so you mentioned before that some of these characters um, reached back out to you. 
after the film became public, what was their response? Um, were they upset at how they were portrayed? How did they, how did, what did they say? I can't talk about it too much. What I can say is that most people think it's a fair representation. Like I said, it holds a mirror to the movement. Some of the individuals portrayed disagree. And I think all of their, their gripes are invalid. The thing was rigorously reported, fact-checked, went through a legal review. It really had the journalistic rigor of any Atlantic cover story. I mean, we spent four years on this going through hundreds of drafts. And I think for them, ultimately, this being kind of an unvarnished film that exposes something that's really personal and intimate, it was difficult for some of the subjects to watch that and, and to have it be so out in the open when, like I said, their public image is so strong and, and powerful. So they weren't happy with their portrayal, but I think most of them came to terms with it. There are some individuals who I won't name who are a little bit more upset about it, but I don't think anyone is alleging that, it, that it's unfair to them because, you know, it is. It's, it's, it's a reflection of the world. It's a reflection of this movement as it occurred, as it went mainstream, and then eventually as it started to taper off over time. Yeah. Michael, I was wondering from your marketing background, if you could kind of tell us, like, how do you think their public brands that these people are, you know, putting together? How was it affected by this film? Was this a good idea for them to join the film? I know a lot of them think that, like, any publicity is good publicity. So is that actually true in this case? Yeah, you know, um, it's hard It's hard to think now, specifically now, that any publicity is good publicity. Uh, you know, obviously like-minded individuals that heard a message and then started to follow them and interact with them. Um, they were excited about this person, et cetera, and maybe a new voice to kind of reiterate what they were feeling or believing, but then quickly, you know, either through uh, the movie and kind of, you know, and it's interesting too, as we watch this film, there's a lot of um, reflection that we're doing on their, that person's behavior, but there's a lot of the cognitive blind spots that people kind of experience and go, well, I didn't say that, or I said it and I didn't mean it. And it's totally going to be okay. And da, 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 da. And that's why I'm sure they're reaching out to Daniel going, Hey, you misrepresented me. It's like, no, that, that was you saying that. And so there's no way to I didn't, you know, there was, there was no deep fake work done. That's actually you saying it. So, of course, the personal brand was, uh, in some ways, was built up with people with like-mindedness. But you have to remember that, I think we kind of hit it several times, is all of these people were kind of in transition as a human being, trying to figure out what their identity is and what it should be and what it can be, and then maybe monetizing those things. And so, as people go back and forth and ebb and flow, you know, and Lauren, um, uh, you know, had a biracial child and all of a sudden it's like she took a big hit because people are like, she's not the real thing. And so I don't, I mean, when you share what your beliefs are out there, your real beliefs, there's going to be a lot of people that don't believe what you believe. And there's going to be a lot of people that do believe what you believe. And so, and we tend to kind of, you know, congregate together in hopefully a, a friendly echo chamber as opposed to a dangerous echo chamber. And then from there, um, you know, it's, it's just an interesting thing. I think we're in such a unique time, especially with everything that's been taken down on Facebook, everything that's been taken down on Twitter, and everything that's been taken down um, on other social venues. It's just, um, you gotta be careful what you do in your personal brand and how you share it, because you're really building up a kind of a perception of yourself or a shadow of yourself that may not really be you, which I think, again, is why people reached out to Daniel and said, it's not really me. It's like, well, yeah, it is promise. Yeah. So Trisha, I was wondering, Daniel mentioned that Lauren was the most compelling character for him as he was ma making this film. Did any of the characters in particular stand out to you as you were watching the film? Yeah, I mean, gosh, they're all just so compelling. So I don't know if there was one, I was just sort of I don't know, equally, I, I was an equal opportunity uh, follower in terms of all three stories. But, you know, it was interesting. I, I actually, I think because the stories about the, I, I sort of focused a little bit more on the secondary characters in some capacity, because I just found it interesting. Okay, you've got these three people, but what are the ecosystems around them like, you know? And I just found it so intriguing, um, you know, that, that, as we've discussed, two of the three have partners who are non-white. Um, I find that just fascinating in and of itself. But I also, so one one note that I took actually was, I think it was Colin Robertson, who's the filmmaker for Lauren Southern, Southern, excuse me. I sort of noted this down because he was the one person maybe in the film who just laid it out. He's like, there's a YouTube algorithm. 
we sterilize the message, we make it accessible, and we make it pretty. You know, and I sort of thought some of our biggest challenges in the world is because we don't have information. Like we don't quite know, you know, what the best way is to address climate change, or we don't quite know how you, you know, I mean, they're complex systems. And I was thinking, you know what? That's it. He just laid it out. Like we know what the problem is here, and we know how this disinformation and misinformation is is spread. And so does everybody else. And so, you know, I just thought it was fascinating because in this case, we just we know how it how it's happening and how 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 they're how it's being built. Right. There's no surprise there. Um, one thing that I would add to that, though, which I think is super important to note, is that this isn't just the dopamine hit that you know Mike talked about. It's not just on the right. So I think it's so important for everybody who's listening to understand that you know. There are, um, like even this happened in the 2016 election, but in September of 2020, Reuters uh, reported that, um, I believe it was Facebook, pulled down a group that was called Peace Data, P-I-E-C-E. And it was essentially a, a Russian group that was trying to hire local journalists to write progressive news. And the whole point, I mean, the whole, I'm talking about sort of a different phenomenon, but the whole point in terms of some of the interference is just to destabilize, right? The whole it's to question the elections, to to sort of drive division, to flame tensions. And so I think it's also important to know that just for folks who maybe are social media users, that this is if you feel like your heart rate's going or you're kind of getting revved up, potentially you're seeing content that is meant to do that. Um, and so I think it's important to just note that even if we're focusing on the alt right it's there's there's efforts to radicalize um or at least i should say maybe drive the divisions between um what could be considered you know two sides so so i think that's the other piece but i i just was i was sort of it was remarkable um so I wrote down Colin Robertson, and then also I think just the the clips where uh Lauren was was um interviewing refugees and immigrants uh, I, I would actually love to hear more about that because I wonder if there were, were deeper conversations. Was it as sort of shallow? It felt like it felt like there were moments of potential learning there yeah. and then sort of just retrenchment, immediate retrenchment. And actually, as a, I realize this is not my role to ask a question, but I'm so curious, Daniel, given all the time that you've spent with folks, yeah. did they want to know about you and your story? And did you feel like there was any kind of openness on their behalf uh, to learn more about, you know, why you were drawn to them and what, what your own personal story and history is. Is it okay if I? Yeah, of course. I know. Yeah. Sorry, Steve. No, you're no, good. That's fascinating. And I love your assessment, both of you, both yours and Michael's. You know, I spent hundreds, thousands of hours with these people. We were having, you know, traveling, taking road trips, eating together, everything and and for every minute you see in the film it was probably 10 or 20 hours of real life spent with them off the record eating all the rest you know i think there was some sincerity i think part of the intimacy i achieved is because they came to have an intimate relationship with me it was difficult because i i am a journalist and i'm very strict about maintaining that journalistic distance so the subjects in the film never saw what we call rushes which are you know footage from the field they never had the opportunity to review cuts, to give notes on it, to have really any control over their image the way they traditionally would as an influencer, you know, in the way that Michael described before. Their image was, you know, was purely at, at my control and at the control of the Atlantic's, at, at the Atlantic. At the same time, you know, they came to kind of see it as, even though it was the Atlantic's film and they understood that it would be at festivals and eventually be on the streaming service, it was sort of Daniel's project and they kind of looked forward to seeing me, to updating me on their life many, many things that didn't make the film that were off the record that, you know, I can't even talk about publicly. And I think it's just a matter of, you know, spending so much time with the person in, in, you know, potentially dangerous and, and strange environments like being in Russia, for instance, is three minutes in the film. I spent 10 days with Lauren Southern and, and Brittany and Brittany Pettibone, you know, in, in the heart in Moscow interviewing, you know, Kremlin sycophants and, and far right officials there. And, it was just such a bizarre and surreal experience that you inevitably become close to some extent with the person you're with. But it was a very difficult relationship because even though I was a confidant and, you know, Lauren Southern would be texting me things at two in the morning, some of which ended up in a, in a written story that I, that I did on her for the Atlantic. 
all of which was on the record because I'm a journalist, I also wasn't there to be her friend and I would have to be very careful to maintain that boundary. So it was, it was, a, it was a constant dance and something that I was always working through, talking with my editors with, you know, back at the Atlantic and really making sure that they understood where the lines were. But, um, you know, when you spend that much time with anyone it, as a documentarian, it, it can become difficult. To the point about France, I can take very quickly. There's a moment with Lauren in the car after she interviews the migrants where you think maybe she's changing. You can see emotionally that she had some realization. She had some sympathy for these desperate asylum seekers who are living underneath a bridge in squalor. There's rats scampering beneath their feet. But, you know, she, like to Michael's point, understands her audience. She's an influencer who is captive to her base, who donate money to her. And it would be, you know, ideologically inc inconsistent for Lauren Southern, the brand, to have any sympathy for, you know, these migrants who nearly died in the Med Mediterranean Sea, desperately came to Europe and now can't even get a job. So, you know, anytime, you know, in their private capacity, they might have some sympathy for ideas or individuals you wouldn't expect, their public persona kind of comes in and, and contradicts it. And I think that's what you're seeing when you see Lauren in the car for a moment change, but then, you know, ultimately um, step back and, and towards the end of the film. And even now, like I mentioned, she's become as right wing as ever. She lives in Australia. She's an, she's a COVID, pretty much a COVID denier. She's an anti-masker. And she's uh, appearing as a conservative commentator on Sky News in Australia, which is kind of like the Fox News equivalent in the country. Um, so it, it can be very difficult to, to kind of leave your brand once you've built it. Yeah. So um, we have about five minutes left in this section. So we have a question from the audience um, or two questions from the audience. Um, so I, I'd like to ask those. Um, the first one, I think this one's for you, Daniel, comes from um, a student, Jules, um, mm -hmm. on your research, how do you feel Canadian attitudes surrounding Lauren Southern different, differ from those of people in the US? Do you think there is as much of a risk of these issues in Canada or even more specifically in Quebec? Canadians are vastly overrepresented in the far right, which is surprising to Canadians. I went to school in Canada. I love Canada. I love Montreal where I went to college. There are many Canadians that are represented in this movement, Gavin, Mc even in the film, Gavin McGuinness, Lauren Southern, Stefan Molyneux, who's a far right uh, conspiracy theorist, Faith Goldie, many, many others who, have, who play very prominent roles, not only in the Canadian context, but really in the American context. I think it, it's difficult to explain how or why that happened. I think one of the main reasons is that Canada is actually better at teaching and correcting for multiculturalism. I think there's a really robust education there and understanding that Canada is a multicultural nation. It's an immigrant nation. They learn about First Nations, about Native Canadians from a very young age in a way that Americans don't. I mean, we had a basic understanding of the civil rights movement, of the persecution of Native Americans in this country, but it was kind of cursory in my school, at least in suburban New York. But in Canada, it's a pretty robust um, you know, program and, and curriculum. I think that means that most Canadians are very progressive, probably more progressive than Americans, but it inevitably leads to a backlash. When you are teaching something in more of a heavy handed manner, it might work for the common good, but you're inevitably going to get the five or 10 or 20% that resents it. And I think in Canada, you find that the right wing in, in some ways can be even more mobilized or more extreme than the right wing in America. And it's surprising to my Canadian friends and they don't understand how, how it's possible, but, um, it's, it's, it's truly surreal. I mean, there are, there are Canadians everywhere you look in the alt-right and they've had a disruptive force in, in America more than any European figures I can think of. Thank you. Yeah. And then the second question, um, I guess this one's more directed towards Michael and Trisha. Um, the question is, how does DU feel about Parler? I don't know that DU will have in, uh, a feeling about Parler, but maybe you could speak just a little bit about Parler and how that interplays with all of this. So Parler is, uh, was a is a conservative haven, right? For um, like a conservative Twitter, basically. And one of the founders, if you do not know, one of the founders is a DU alum. And mm -hmm. so um, that was an interesting thing to learn about. And then Parler obviously, uh, um, lots of things happen to Parler. So Amazon Web Services no longer hosted Parler. Parler was taken off of the App Store, Google Play, et cetera. And so um, they were struggling to figure out what they were going to do as a business. The president has recently been removed. 
Um, I'm not sure, you know, what everybody's taste for what's been going on in that platform. What's interesting about that platform is that they have um, a hacker um, scraped, hacked into the system and scraped all of the content that's ever been created on Parler. And some of that content included pictures of people's uh, driver's licenses, um, conversations they've had, because you could have a premier membership if you shared your driver's license, is my understanding. Um, so I'm sure that DU is not, um, I don't think DU has a problem with con being conservative. I think DU definitely has a problem when you go from conservative to uh, you know, um, white supremacy. And so as a consequence, it's like, that's, that's the line. And they go, okay, well, we don't support that. We're, we support people to have uh, their own opinions, but the second it becomes dangerous, um, you know, kind of back off. I am not an official spokesperson for DU, but I would assume that that's how they feel. Yeah, I, again, I feel like similar to what Mike was saying, I think it's just important to recognize. And I think this is actually a point that becomes confused sometimes, right? So people will say, oh, well, First Amendment, you know, free speech. But there's a clear distinction between unprotected speech that actually creates or incites violence. That is not a class of protected speech. And so as soon as you move into speech that is that is seeking to, you know, promulgate violence, then then this is something that obviously we cannot condone. Awesome. Um, so I guess, Daniel, one last question for you before we take a break. Um, you had mentioned before we started the, the webinar that, you know, that there have been times where you've had events like this and there have been some people from Lauren Southern's followings or other people's followings that have sort of Zoom bombed the event. What kind of backlash have you or the Atlantic received from the white nationalist movement after releasing this film, and, and how do you deal with that? So I mentioned I'm, I'm I'm Jewish, and you know I talk pretty openly about my grandmother's being Holocaust survivors. When I was producing the film, it was mostly fine. My last name sounds Italian. Everyone is under the assumption that I am Italian. I don't necessarily look particularly Jewish, and I got away with it. I think for the few years that I was there, of course I would talk about it if anyone asked, but you know, I wasn't walking around and introducing myself as the young Jewish reporter. Um, you know, since the film has come out, a lot of the framing around the film is like kind of the meta narrative is about my personal story and kind of the Jewish kid who embedded in the alt-right for three or four years. And that just set myself up for, I set myself up for just a torrent of hate mail and anti-Semitic abuse and, you know, on Twitter, but on email. And it, it got pretty nasty when the film came out. Um, it has since receded, but it kind of goes in waves whenever, again, I don't want to name names, but there are some individuals who don't like the film and whenever they incite against the film, then there's a new wave of anti-Semitic abuse. Um, they've also made huge efforts to sink our, our, our scores on all public <laughs> rating areas like IMDb and others. So it's been flooded with fake reviews, people who we just call it left wing garbage and things like that, even though it's a rigorously reported objective piece of journalism. Um, so I guess those are the two main areas. We're really trying to affect the reputation of the film. Thank you. Thankfully, critics have loved it and it's doing well, but also um, personally attacking my, my background. Um, I see it sort of as a badge of honor and, you know, it's something I'm willing to live with. And ultimately, so far, it's been it's been harmless. It's purely been in the in the virtual space. Thank you. So um, it's 4.52 now. Let's conclude the first part of our webinar. Um, we'll take a five minute bathroom break um, and stretch break. Um, our attendees too maybe want to take a break as well. Um, at 4.57, um, we will return and then we'll kind of shift the discussion a little bit and talk about the implications of all of this for businesses and institutions. Um, and we'll see you guys then. Thanks for joining. Okay, welcome back. We'll get started again. So for the second part of our event, um, we'll discuss the implications of rising white supremacy in the US and around the globe. 
Um, and as our business school will concentrate primarily on how that has affected the business world and what the business world can do to respond to this challenge to our society. Um, but before that, there's one question that I kind of wanted to pose to the panel. And, and that's like, there's a lot of terms that get um, thrown or thrown around um, in, in this area, white supremacist, white nationalist, the alt-right, the racist right. Um, are there any differences among these terms? Do you use them interchangeably? Can you, can everyone just speak to that a little bit? There are small ideological differences. I think for clarity's sake, the importance is that this movement is concerned with the preservation of white power in America. And I think, you know, people talk about white power ideology, white supremacy, white nationalism. Theoretically, supremacy means you want to conquer, you, you're imperialistic, you want to conquer the rest of the world. Nationalistic or separatist means maybe you're just more inward focused. All of them are, are violent ideologies, so it becomes dangerous when you start to parse this one versus that one. All of them are concerned with changing demographics in this country. The U.S. was, you know, 88 percent uh, white in 1965. Today it's 63% white. 20 years from now is projected to be a majority non-white. All of these groups are upset by this trend and are, are willing to do anything, you know, even fight or, you know, cause terrorist attacks in order to stop the demographic changes that are happening in the U.S. So I think the, the kind of like, if you're looking for a common denominator, it's that, it's the demographic change and it's the groups that are mobilized um, trying to stop it. Anything to add to that, Trisha and Michael? Trisha, go ahead. No, go ahead, Mike. I, I was just gonna say, Daniel seems to have the, you know, best best answer of all of us. So this is not my area at all. Um, so I'll defer to Mike. Agreed. I was just gonna say what I said before, uh, which is Daniel said everything I would have said. So works. <laughs> The only weird wrinkle is QAnon, which has really, you know, blown up over the past year. It's, you know, it doesn't play on racial themes to the same extent. It's more almost like a religion. It's very cult-like. And it, it's actually more heavily anti-Semitic. It's leaning on this idea that the globalists and that elites are running a, a, a sex trafficking ring that are secretly, you know, trafficking children and things like that. It's not overtly racist to the same extent. And sometimes QAnon is conf conflated with the alt-right. And I think that's because many of the people who are drawn to one are drawn to the other and many of the themes overlap. But there's a, this, I don't mean to excuse QAnon in any way, but it's not overtly white nationalist the way that many of the other groups are. Yeah, thanks for that clarification. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. So Trisha, before you had mentioned a little bit about misinformation and disinformation, I was wondering if you could talk a little more about how that's contributed to the growth of white supremacy as we see in the film um, and what role business has really played in the spread of this misinformation. Yeah, so I think it's interesting to think through, you know, what it means about how we, and it's a moment for self-reflection, I think, for all of us, how we get our news, what we consider to be true, how savvy we are at spotting fake news or misinformation. Um, just to share a little bit, I mean, there's been a ton of research on this. Uh, so MIT in 2018 had a report that found that fake news spread six times faster than accurate news on Twitter, and falsehoods are 70% more likely to be retweeted. So think before you tweet, I guess is point number one. Um, but, you know, the other piece of it is it's not just the fact that, okay, so we're all misinformed. Right, it's a specific type of news that's being uh, disseminated so quickly, and so there was actually an internal Facebook report from 2018 that found that 64% of people who joined extremist groups on Facebook did so because their algorithm algorithms led them there, and so I think it's just incredibly important. Again, back to back to sort of the comment from um, Lauren Southern's filmmaker, you know we know how this is happening. And I think it's just so crucial to understand that, you know, these influencers are making money off of this. Companies are making money off of this. And it's not as though, you know, folks aren't aware. So I think even from the 2016 election to the 2020 election, there were, you know, concerted efforts that Facebook made to try to um, 
cull some of the disinformation that maybe found its way to their website. And I think, you know, it's important to note, too, that there are all sorts of legal efforts to try to counter some of this. Um, and so, you know, uh, I guess just thinking through, I guess from, I don't know if they're countering the misinformation or disinformation, but certainly there's there's concerns around the type of power that the social media platforms have. Um, and you'll hear in the news that there's a lot of conversation about repealing or revising Section 230, uh, which really is about whether or not all of these social media companies are providing, are they platforms where everybody just gets to share their information and it's sort of a you know, marketplace of information, or are they essentially publishers? And so I'm sure The Atlantic has lots to say about this, right? Because Facebook and Twitter and Instagram aren't held to the same standard that true publications and true media outlets are. Um, and so I think there's actually a lot to kind of parse out about the business model. Perhaps some, somewhat paradoxically, uh, Facebook's you know, revenue generating model is also making it really hard for traditional journalistic uh, organizations to succeed in this environment. Um, so it's sort of a double whammy there. And I think there's a lot of I mean, it, there's clearly an economic incentive to ensure that misinformation and disinformation doesn't go away. And that's a huge problem. Yeah. What you mentioned that there are some like legal things that, that can affect businesses. What are, the, what are the ways that we kind of can incentivize businesses to start taking this seriously, you know, the misinformation and disinformation problem? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, well, you know, a lot of the, um, a lot of the, I guess, ongoing legal challenges, at least the ones I'm most familiar with, are really around antitrust or sort of concerns about monopoly um, power. And so, you know, I think, uh, gosh, I can't remember if it's, it must be Facebook, but they have a policy that's barrier buy, right? So if, so if, if another platform has a new technology, they either bury it or they buy it. And that's not exactly, you know, the competitive marketplace that we might hope to see. Um, so on one hand, I think there's important, you know, an important kind of recognition that ultimately their value rests on the people who use the platform. Um, and so I think, you know, not underestimating the power of the people who use it, I suppose, would be point number one. But point number two, I think the other pieces, you know, you'll often hear, I think, Anytime you hear just a blatant dichotomy in, in a political debate or a debate with friends, it's always an important to note to say, well, what, what's in between? So it's not that they you know, either have to allow everything or nothing. That's, those aren't the two choices. There are a lot of options in between around um, labeling, you know, noting delaying posts that could be misinformation or disinformation to allow for time to fact check. Um, I think one thing that's really interesting about this whole area is that just time is of the essence. So as soon as something's out there, the longer companies wait to take a stand on it or to make a choice about whether it gets to stay or leave or needs a label, the harder it is to pull it back. And so they need to think carefully, I think, about flagging information, figuring out a process, um, and then thinking through you know, what it looks like to create just a safer environment. And there are ways in which, you know, they've done this before. There are ways in which you can, you know, uh, essentially change the algorithm so that some news is slowed. And that in my mind is just, it's, I think I have goosebumps just saying that out loud, right? That Facebook is sort of dictating how quickly or slowly certain certain issues um, are, are rising to the agenda. And so I think all of these are issues that uh, we should really be more more cognizant of and take action to, to address. Yeah, Michael, um, so a lot of these companies, Facebook and Twitter, they've changed their tune since the January 6th Capitol riots and started doing a lot of things <clears throat> they never do in terms of moderating content and kicking people off their platforms. What is a, you know, like, how does it affect a, a company's brand when they're seen as enabling or associating with white supremacy and, and what do they do about that? Well, you know, it's interesting to touch on what Trisha said. So they're algorithmically promoting content to keep engagement up. 
So there was some analysis that was done uh, within the last four months that, am, that Facebook was actively promoting any posts that were, um, that uh, claimed the Holocaust was made up. And the other one was that COVID was a hoax. So th those are the types of, so they're simply trying to monetize what they forgot <laughs> is that they're, they're utilizing humans and cognitive realities around bias, et cetera, to kind of help them monetize as a consequence. So all of a sudden, I, I honestly, I think it's this, and it feels very foolish, but they're like, they've awakened and they're like, whoa. And so your original question is, what are they doing now to kind of curb? So they've removed a lot of people that they feel um, are uh, inciting negative actions. You know, it's like, so, you know, I, I tend to think of free speech as protecting speech that you don't like. But the second that that speech targets someone and act, asks you to act out against someone, then you've got a problem. And so right now, they've given some lip service to do that. But the fact is that I think I read that they turned some of those algorithmic things back on as far as uh, COVID was a hoax or something. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it's kind of a hit or miss. And the way that I've heard it described is that, you know, they have this, they have a couple of dials they can turn to say, I'm going to make 2 million more dollars from the, the, the East Coast this, this, uh, this day. And then I'm going to make 5 million more dollars from Australia this day by simply turning up the um, kind of the, the, the access to rhetoric and those things. So they're in this un, uncharted waters, right? They are a publisher. And so, and that they don't, nobody wanted to be in that position. They just wanted to be, have people to be able to share, et cetera, and all that. But the fact is that pretty quickly it got uh, unbelievably out of hand. And, you know, I mean, they are, they are, Facebook specifically is partially responsible for what happened at the Capitol. And there's been lots of articles written about it, but the fact is you, you fed people misinformation for three to four years and that's what you got, right? So, um, Anytime now when I look at somebody and I think about how could you possibly believe what you believe, I am quick to remember that they have been probably fed information from individuals or other resources for three or four years and incrementally ratcheting it up until finally it's acceptable to run into the capital and do something and you go, uh oh, you know, and, and so as a company, I would be quick to kind of reassess everything and anything that we allow. And the problem is, the scale, two point whatever billion people on Facebook, it's really hard to monitor those things and then make educated decisions about hotspots and those things. And you can say, well, I can just do it algorithmically and nuke everything. Well, okay, but that's not, that may not be the best way. It may be the safest way, but it may not be the best way. And maybe that is the way. You initially do that and then you kind of dial it back over time and we're gonna, they're gonna have to figure that out. I mean, it's a, it's a hot mess and I would not want that job. Yeah. So, Trisha, it's not just social media companies either that have been affected by being associated with white supremacy. So I think, you know, the film shows the some parts of that Charlottesville rally. And um, I think it was at the Charlottesville rally that tiki torches were used um, by um, the, the people that were going there. Um, so what does a company do when their products are co-opted by these white supremacist movements and you know are there strategies for helping them identify and manage those kinds of risks before their their reputation and their brand gets ruined yeah so there's sort of two points that i want to make one is you know what happens when companies are co-opted but the other piece is that i want to make sure folks understand companies you know historically have not, uh, there has not been, you know, complete impunity, right? They've been held to account for having participated and supported um, gross human rights abuses. So for tiki brands, it may have been easier given its roots are in Polynesia and Hawaiian cultures, right? So they were just able to say, this isn't us pretty, pretty clearly. Um, but I think it's really important to, for, you know, businesses to understand that they can't just take harbor in the private sphere and expect that none of this will touch them or none of this will reach them. Um, economic activity and political activity have never been separate. Economic actors are political, uh, even if they don't want to be. So I think the important piece of this is to really understand what uh, one's position or what a company's position will be and take a stand because it, you know, as Mike has said, that's, that will be your brand. And so you have to sort of have 
a, a response um, ready, ready to go. The piece on the impunity, though, that I wanted to highlight, too, is that you know, there are really interesting examples of corporate accountability from past um, gross human rights abuses. So like in the um, Rwandan genocide, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda actually held two members of what effectively was the board, um, the founder, owner and founder of the radio station, right? That was um, propagating a, a horrible, um, just essentially inciting genocide uh, for the Tutsi minority. And so I think it's important that folks know that when businesses take an active role in, you know, potentially as Facebook and we're sort of implying that there is an active role here to incite violence. The other piece is, you know, this is a more kind of clear um, role, but a number of economic actors were tried and found guilty um, for their participation in the Holocaust. So Bruno Tesh is one of the more well-known examples, but his company produced and sold Zyklon B, which was used in Nazi Germany's extermination camps. But there are a lot of other examples of, of people who financed operations being held to account. Um, and so actually in that, in with the Holocaust, more than 300 economic actors have actually paid, uh, faced prosecution for crimes against humanity during that time. So I think it's just important to note that this is not just you know, there, there's there's precedent here in terms of holding economic actors accountable for uh, their role in inciting violence, and that that should be underscored. Yeah, and and you know, I think one of the things that Daniels were were trying to learn is how do we not get to that point where businesses have to be accountable, but they're hopefully thinking about these in advance in a more ethical way. Um, so there's this saying um, that's been going around a lot: uh, "Get woke, go broke." Um, and the idea is that corporate social responsibility and impact are in tension with profits and monetization. Um, so I'll, I'll open this up to the entire panel. Like, how do companies like Facebook balance their need to make money with, you know, the social impacts they're having and their responsibilities to the communities that they're essentially serving? It's a very difficult question. <laughs> I think one, two quick points, and then I'll leave it to you, who are you two, who are both well, more well versed here. Part of it is diversity in hiring. I mean, most of the major institutions and companies in this country are still run by white men. The majority of the white, of the CEOs on the you know the Forbes list are are white men coming from inherited wealth. You know, there's still not a lot of diversity at higher levels of power in this country, and I think thinking journalistically, when a problematic story, for instance, comes to a room full of editors, it's important that you have a voice in the room who can say, this is an issue, maybe we should fix that use of that use of phrasing or vocabulary there. You need to have, it's important to have representation, not just to, you know, as a token for marketing materials or to, to use to flaunt your diversity numbers, but to actually have a strong, confident voice who can speak to the concerns of a community, can be that ambassador and representative. And when things have gone wrong in journalism, like the New Republic, which is a used to be a bigger magazine and now is a smaller magazine, published an excerpt from a book called The Bell Curve about how basically modern scientific racism in the 90s, the, the book alleged that people of color had lower IQs and it's partially their fault. That's, it's that, that they're less evolved than, than, than whites. Completely bunk, untrue. It's purely societal reasons why there's IQ differences between races. And it's always corrected when someone, a person of color, grows up in a, in a wealthier home and it goes through a good education system. Anyway, The New Republic, which is a magazine I respect at the time, didn't have any people of color in the room. There was no one there to say, this is horrible scientific racism. It's dangerous, we shouldn't publish it. It went to press and you know really affected the reputation of the magazine. So that's, that's an example from my industry that comes to mind. On the algorithms question, I, I leave it to you too, but the one thing I've observed is that just emotional content of all kinds does well on social media. Radical, it can be you know fundamentalism, it can be any kind. And I was thinking of a Cernovich quote that didn't make the film, but he told me once that he's a dealer and an addict. He's a dealer in that he's creating the conspiracies that people, it was really kind of wise, a moment of self-awareness from him that he's creating the conspiracies that people are consuming, but he's also an addict himself and that he's always on his phone. <laughs> If you're with him for 10 hours, he's on his phone for eight hours of, of the time. 
if you're having lunch with him and his wife, he's on his phone, he's checking Facebook, and he really depends on that dopamine hit that he gets from Twitter. So it's really kind of a complicated thing where you depend on the emotional reaction that you get from these tech platforms. I think one of the, so one of the businesses about a month ago, Apple announced its diversity project and they are donating a hundred million dollars to uh, three pro primary things, the Propel Center, which is, uh, it's gonna be a global innovation center and learning hub for histor historically black colleges and universities. Um, they're also at, uh, announced the Apple Developer Academy to support coding and tech education for students in Detroit. And then venture capital funding for funding for black and brown entrepreneurs. So I think this is a, a great way for a brand to do something instead of say something, right? So I, th I thought that was very, uh, thought it was wise, thought it was appropriate, thought it might be a little bit later than what we had all hoped, but I think it, it makes sense. Um, algorithmically to, to tell a company that, or to suggest to a company that it's gonna, they're gonna have to be okay with them making less money um, I think that's going to be a bit of a challenge for sure, but I do think there's some opportunities that, and not to get too into the weeds, but I think if businesses started to partner with customers to say, share these data points with me and then tell me what you're okay with, then I won't have to try to monetize engagement through uh, ridiculous ways. I can try to monetize engagement through ways that are meaningful to you. Um, currently, it really is just a matter of, well, what are they, what are they looking at the most? You know, it's like, uh, like you said, eight hours out of 10 hours. And so that content, is that help, helpful? Uh, does it make you a better person? Does it fulfill your needs? Or is it touching some part of your brain that's like, oh, this is good. I'm, I'm saying something that's going to make me money, but I may or may not agree with, right? And so it's an interesting, um, interesting time. Mm. Trish, anything to add to that? I was just going to say there's maybe I don't I was feeling guilty about the questions in the Q&A feeling like we should get to get to those folks so okay I'll rescind my time got it okay yeah I do like Michael what you said about um, monetizing things that are meaningful uh, my background is as a product manager and I think when I was watching both um, the Daniels film and then also you mentioned the social dilemma it stood out to me it was like these social media companies they're not actually solving real problems for real people um, and that's the core of product management is really, you need to understand your user and what their unmet needs are and, and try and solve a real problem for them. And if you just look at them as a revenue source to exploit, that's where I think the starting point of where things start to go. Very, very. Completely, completely agree. Yeah. Cool. Well, so before we get to the questions in the chat, there's one last question I want to ask you guys really quickly, which is we talked a little bit about what businesses can maybe do to respond to this um, challenge of white supremacy and nationalism, what can individuals do? Hmm. What can we as individuals do? Well, I have to tell you, my, I'll, I'll speak briefly on this. I try to plant seeds. So if I hear anybody that I know, that I vague, know vaguely, that has an opinion that I think could morph into something dangerous, try to plant seeds and just go, you know, I've heard these things and you might want to look at this. You know, and also quickly, it's funny too, just as kind of a baseline, on some level, I kind of say, you know, you are getting very specialized search results, very specialized news feeds based on past behavior. So it's reinforcing what you've seen. So if you saw BS to begin with, you're seeing BS squared by the you know time that you're watching this. So I, I just kind of plant seeds and go, you know, be interesting to go to some of the place, this was easier before COVID, but go to the library, just do a search on something and see what comes up. Right, or do a search on something, somebody else's phone that might not share the same views because I think you'll be surprised at what comes up. And I feel like in a lot of ways, um, the, the kind of the, you know, the, the man behind the curtain has been revealed and people are going, wait a minute, maybe I don't believe this because maybe this isn't true. So I would just say plant seeds. Trisha or Daniel? Daniel, go ahead. I'm sure you have a lot of thoughts on this. Too. No, I, I, I don't. Uh, <laughs> Michael said it well. I think my only contribution here would be that shaming doesn't work. And mm -hmm. we have a politics of shame right now. And even though I'm more of a left-leaning person, I don't think that dumping on someone who's coming from a right-wing or even a conspiratorial position is effective in any way. And having been with those people, they use it as further justification to stay in their space. Mm -hmm. So they say... 
maybe I'm some of them who have serious doubts say maybe I'm doubting this, but look at the other side, they're just as bad. And of course, that's both sides is um, there's a lot of ideological inconsistency there and fallacy. But if you're actually invested in de-radicalization and bringing people back from the brink, my view is that there has to be some empathy. You have to kind of meet people in the middle, not agreeing with them in any way. But like Michael said, sharing better resources, showing some level of understanding. I just, I just think social media incentivizes all the worst behaviors and even people who I agree with on the left um, exhibit those at times. And it only increases polarization in the long run, in my view. These yeah. conversations that we're having right now are the exact conversations we should be having, all we should be having. Yeah, I, I agree with what's said. I mean, I feel like it's a two part thing. One, it's just check your own behavior. Um, and I wanted to point out that, you know, this is happening on the left just as it's happening on the right, maybe to differing degrees, but like we're, we're all susceptible to, to the process that is so clear in, in, in Daniel's film. And I think too, just monitor your emotions. If you're getting fired up by looking at your Twitter feed, probably not necessary, you know? I mean, just go to the uh, newspaper website, right? And just look at the news in that way. Um, I never get too excited when I'm reading the Denver Post. I'm just kidding. That's a compliment. That's a compliment. Um, but the last thing I was going to say is that, you know, this is kind of what Daniel ended on, which is really just that, you know, I think I think what is, is so clear to me is that these efforts are meant to destabilize our democratic system. And our democratic system is based on being able to have civil conversation with people who think differently than you and bring different lived experiences to the table. And so there's a term called agonism and agon is Greek, uh, which means struggle. And so the whole notion behind this is that legitimacy can be gained through contestation that it's not about us all agreeing, but that if we can learn how to embrace and absorb contestation, um, that there's real strength that comes from that. And so I think it's important to note that we don't all have to agree, but we need to be able to disagree in a civil fashion. And without that, we're, we're not doing too hot to, you know, I mean, it's just not going to end well for any of us. So, um, so I think it's really important to just think about, you know, our own consumption, but then also just how we're practicing that. How are we practicing, you know, being able to engage with, with viewpoints that are different than ours. So make it a practice to Michael's point. I mean, that's going to the library, that's picking up a phone that someone else's, that's going to websites that are reputable, but present a more conservative or liberal leaning version of the news. Right. And so I think, you know, there are a lot of resources online about the quality of your news sources, and that's super important to educate yourself about where you're, where you're getting your information from. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think critical thinking skills and the, the proper application of them is probably really key to that. So we'll move on to some of the questions that we've gotten in the uh, Q&A box now. Um, so, um, uh, the first one I'll ask is for um, Daniel, and this kind of, I guess, goes a little bit off the theme we were just talking about. Um, how do we best communicate to those who still think that the information that they're getting is true and just if it's misinformation? They are coworkers and good friends that believe in the online rhetoric and follow um, what, you know, what these white supremacists are saying, even if they are not in the mob. Um, how can we find commonality? It's very difficult. I think I'm going to be somewhat redundant here. It's, it's difficult to find common ground with ideas that are rooted in fallacy. I mean, there, being a reporter, everything in the film, everything I've done goes through a fact-checking process. I still have a notion, which for most of human history, at least American history, was that there is objective fact that you can reach. There are certain things that are true. Gravity exists, right? If you drop a ball, it falls to the floor. We live in a reality now where there is no understanding of, of the common good, but also common facts, things that are objectively true. I mean, um, Kellyanne Conway said famously that she has her own alternative facts. The administration has their own alternative facts, which is, you know, defying the very notion of the word. It's difficult to, you know, convince someone who has their own alternative facts that, you're all, that your true facts are accurate. I think it go, goes back to my point before, which is that this is primarily an, an emotional ideology. People become 
animated by this because it provides an identity that they were missing in, the, in any previous context. And I think if you're going to decouple them from the, the, the news they're consuming, you have to find a way to provide a new, better identity, a constructive identity that isn't destructive in the way that this is. So you have to find a way to fill that emotional void that sadly white nationalism or QAnon or these other things are filling for that individual. And, you know, historically, there are many ways people found community through the church, through a family, through their job. And I think that's the real challenge is bringing people back who are radicalized is helping them find a, you know, a positive identity that that's divorced from this really vitriolic, polit vitriolic politics that we're experiencing now. I think that's a, that's great advice. We were talking about lost souls before. So it's, how do you, how do you, you know, bring that lost soul back? Um, I think is a, is a great way to frame it. Yeah. Thank you. So um, we have time for one more question um, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, do companies like Amazon overstep or do their detractors have a leg to stand on in their criticisms when they enforce content moderation on companies like Parler um, only after a public incident is directly linked to it? Um, do you feel that the industry self-policing or the government forcing them to is more effective at dissipating hate speech. Maybe this is for Tricia or Michael. Sure. I mean, I'll jump in, not specific to this, but I think, you know, there are there are sort of three sets of tools. I think of carrots, sticks, and sunshine. So are you leading, you know, are you regulating incentives? So people are going after the carrot. Are you penalizing them? Uh, with a stick, or are you just opening up the the process with greater transparency? And so I think it's not whether self-policing or the government, it's not one or the other. It's going to take a combination of tools to make any kind of impact on, on this space. Awesome. Thank you. So we're, we're right about up on time here. We want to respect everybody's Friday evening and weekend. Um, so we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, any last thoughts from any of our panelists? This was a great conversation. I've, we, I, most of my discussions of the film were more about race and racism, and it was great to have more of a kind of a tech-focused conversation. Um, so thank you guys for inviting me and for having such uh, thoughtful words of wisdom on what to do about this problem. No, just just thank you to the organizers, the panelists, Daniel. It's been a pleasure to welcome you virtually, at least, to the University of Denver, and maybe sometime we can we can invite you here in person in the future. So thanks for your work. Yes, Daniel. Thank you for the film. Thank you, guys. So thank you to all of our panelists again. As Trisha said, to everyone that helped organize this. If you haven't had a chance to watch the film yet, it's still active until tomorrow on the link. And then after that, for our DU staff and students, it's available um, through the DU library. Um, and we'll hopefully be sending out a survey about this. The DEI community really appreciates feedback as we continue to provide meaningful and helpful content to our community. Um, so if you receive that, we hope you'll fill it out. Thanks again, everyone, and have a great evening and a great weekend. Thank you so much, everyone. That was truly a fantastic panel. I uh, even though it's a Friday in the evening, I wish it could go a little longer. Um, I'd like to take, thank a moment to thank our panelists and presenters one last time. Um, a final reminder for those of you who joined us live today, you will receive an email link with a session evaluation. So at least on our end, we will be sending one out and we gre greatly appreciate your feedback. Please view the online schedule and register for our upcoming diversity summit sessions. Thank you again for joining us and we hope you will find us uh, will join us on our next panel, which will be this Monday, the intersectionality panel at 1030 a.m. and the LGBTQIA plus starting at 4 p.m. Thanks, everyone, and have a great uh, weekend. <laughs>